Please welcome Neil and his son Jen. Thank you, Jack of all trades, master of none, as they say. The, the last time I gave a talk about Priestley's Wars was at the uh, Cheltenham Literature Festival, and two theatrical knights who were both Priestley devotees, uh, Sir Patrick Stewart and Sir Timothy West, uh, did the readings from Priestley's work on that occasion, so uh, no pressure tonight, Jack. Uh, this book came about because uh, J.B. Priestley's son, Tom, who was a very uh, acclaimed film editor in his own right, rediscovered, if you like, a box, a cardboard box of uh, Priestley's letters from the First World War that had been sitting half forgotten under his bed for 30 or 40 years. They were unpublished letters, and when Tom read them, we, we discussed how we might bring these to the, the page. Uh, you also mentioned to me that the scripts for postscripts, the series of broadcasts, hugely influential broadcasts he made during the Second World War, had never been published either in their entirety. One or two had been published, but the majority had never been seen. So those became the two poles of the book we were going to write, if you like. Priestley's letters from the trenches in the First World War, and the postscripts he delivered during the Second World War. And as I went further into it, I discovered that Priestley's war writings extended right throughout his life, right up to the last days of his life, if you like, when he was one of the principal driving forces and co-founders of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. So that was the, uh, the arc, as they say in Hollywood, the journey, the personal odyssey of John Boynton Priestley that we wanted to trace, beginning just a few days before his uh, 20th birthday, when Priestley enlisted in uh, September 1914. On the face of it, that was an extraordinary decision for a young man who only 12 months before had written a furiously anti-war article in a Bradford socialist publication. His father, a lifelong socialist and a fiery ca character in the city which had given birth to the independent Labour Party, must have been aghast at his son's decision to go to war. Unfortunately, there's no record left of uh, what he said to his son in an effort to persuade him not to enlist. But it's tempting, I think, to see echoes of, of what he might have said in the character of Uncle Nick in Priestley's Lost Empires, a novel written 50 years later about a theatre company on the brink of the First World War. Yo, what? Uh, enlisting, I'm joining Kitchener's army. He put his cigar down. Lad, you must be out your bloody mind. Army? Why should you go and join any army? I'll give you a dozen good reasons why you shouldn't. Now you just give me one good reason why you should. It's hard to explain, I began slowly. It's impossible to explain unless you go in at the pole barney. What you really believe, even if you don't say so, is what all these other silly brothers believe. That it's going to be a kind of picnic. A few months of marching and cheering, flag waving. Then Germany will be done for and you'll be all back home, heroes with medals to show. Um, no, I don't think. Just you listen to me, and get this into your head, lad. I'm not like all these people. I've been to Germany. I've played Berlin, Hamburg, Munich, Frankfurt, and I've kept my eyes and ears open. I know the Germans. They've built up a military machine that'll make you look like so many tin soldiers. They may take Paris, I don't know. But what I do know is, is that they're going to take a hell of a lot of beating. All over in a few months. They're talking like school kids. This war isn't going to last months. It's going to last years and years. And every year it'll get worse. You're asking to be put in a bloody mincing machine, lad. We're in for the biggest bloody massacre of all time. And you can't even wait for them to fetch you. Priestley remained silent about his reasons for enlisting until almost 50 years later, when, as uh, Nigel said, he published his autobiography, Margin Released, in 1962. I often asked myself why I joined the army. The usual explanations were no good. I was not hot with patriotic feeling. I did not believe that Britain was in any real danger. I was sorry for gallant little Belgium, but did not feel she was waiting for me to rescue her. The legend of Kitchener, who pointed at us from every hoarding, had never captured me. I was, not in any, oh, I was not under any pressure from public opinion, which had not got to work on young men as early as that. The white feathers came later. I was not carried to the recruiting office in a herd rush of chums, nobody thinking, everybody half plastered. I went alone. Most of my friends joined elsewhere, and later when the local PALS battalion was formed. And in July 1916 on the Somme, that battalion might have been dry moorland glass 
grass that someone had set a match to. I was not simply swapping jobs, though the office bored me. Life in the army certainly did not attract me, and for some years I had regarded with contempt those lads who had wanted to wear a uniform and be marched about. This was no escape to freedom and independence. I did not see myself as a hero whose true stature would be revealed by war. That had never been one of my illusions. What is left, then, to supply a motive? Nothing, I believe now, that was rational and conscious. We began without any equipment at all. There was not enough khaki cloth for regulation uniforms, and I remember my own mortification. I had been one of the few who were wearing khaki a day after enlistment. When I had to turn in my uniform and wear instead a doleful, convict-style blue outfit, together with a ridiculous little forage cap. For my Christmas leave, I remember that somewhere or other, I put, picked up an old, much larger and dead black forage cap, which gave me, or so I fancied, a half-raffish, half-sinister look. And when I wore this and a long black overcoat, part of a swap, and the oddest of the scarves I'd been sent, I looked a long way from Kitchener's army. Someone who had enlisted in some dark, bloodthirsty legion in Tashkent, or so, forgetting my innocent pudding face and guileless Bradford accent, I like to think. Certainly the girls I knew at home stared at me in bewilderment, lit with fascination. I knew you'd join up, Jack, but I mean to say, what are you in? To Priestley's frustration, instead of setting straight off for the uh, Western Front, he continued training for almost a year. A process of disillusion began during that. As he later said, he spent the first year trying to be a hero and the rest of the war just trying to survive. He finally made it to the Western Front in September 1915, and the letters he wrote home to his family from there, while rough and raw compared to the polished, finished work that he later wrote, offer a vivid picture of the experience of trench warfare. 27 September 1915. We were in the fire trenches 12 consecutive days before being relieved, up to the knees in water and covered with mud from head to foot. On Saturday morning, we were subjected to a fearful bombardment by the German heavy artillery. They simply rained shells and our artillery rained them back. And there we were, the poor, long-suffering infantry, crouched in our trenches, expecting each moment to be our last. One shell burst right in our trench, and it was a miracle that so few, only four, were injured. I have seen some terrible sights, and endured some hardships, but believe me, I never lost my nerve, and strange to say, I felt a strange exaltation of the soul at the expense of the body. Do not be afraid for me. I am not afraid. I suppose I am a man now, and I'm certainly going through an ordeal. Perhaps it would be as well if everybody went through some test of manhood. 1st of January, 1916. I am writing this in my dugout, about two feet high and five feet long, by the miserable light of a guttering little bit of candle. Soon it will go out, and then... But it's only 5.30 and a wild night come the long, long, dark hours until stand to in the morning. Last night, old year's night, was a nightmare evening. Both our artillery and theirs were going for all they were worth, and they lit up the sky. You could see some of the shells going through the air, swift red streaks. Then an incessant stream of bullets from both sides, bombs, trench mortars, making a hellish din, and the sky lit up with a mad medley of shells, searchlights, starlights, the green and red rockets used for signalling purposes. Just about an hour of hell, that was our introduction to the year of 1916. This morning I learned that we lost about 80 men and several officers. 13th of March 1916. We are soldiering, as the Tommies phrase it, in earnest now, we have just been in the ghastliest part of the Western Front. There is nothing like it. We relieved the French there, and they looked relieved too. You must have heard of the famous labyrinth. Well, that's it. 
Great hills half blown away with enormous shells, villages absolutely razed to the ground, old trenches full of heads, legs and arms, blood-stained clothing and old equipment. The place is one vast morgue, has been taken and retaken so many times. The frontline trench is a ditch about three feet deep and there are no communication trenches. You simply crawl up in the dark and lie in the trench until relieved, which is often 24 hours. It had been quiet recently around there until we British arrived, but of course we had to hot it up for the sake of our morale. To keep our fellows on their toes, in spite of the fact, not hard to discover on the map, and all too obvious to any staff officer who went to see it for himself. But if we did start anything, the Germans, higher up, well dug in, and in places not more than 20 yards away would have the better of it. So very soon, having asked for it, God knows why, we caught a packet. His last letter was written on the 1st of June, 1916, and it ended enclosed the flowers plucked from the parapet, probably growing out of dead men. There are plenty of those from these parapets. It's no uncommon sight to see a hand or a foot sticking out. Priestley had been lucky so far. He got through the war without a scratch, but that was the day his luck ran out. A Minenwerfer, the most feared of German weapons, like a dustbin packed with explosives, came tumbling out of the skies and landed in his trench. The next thing he knew, he was buried alive and didn't recover consciousness until military hospital. That experience left him with a lifetime of claustrophobia. He couldn't even travel on the tube after that. And previously, a heavy sleeper, if there was sleep for the rest of the life, was disturbed as well with nightmares. His wartime experiences, he went on to serve as an officer away from the front lines, but those experiences in the first year of the war fueled his sense of outrage at the way he and his fellow soldiers had been treated. The British Army never saw itself as a citizen's army. It behaved as if a small, gentlemanly officer class still had to make soldiers out of undergardeners, runaway sons and slum lads, known to the police. These fellows had to be kept up to scratch. Let them get slack, there'd soon be a rabble again. So where the Germans and French could hold a bad front line with a minimum of men, allowing the majority to get some rest, the British command would pack men into rotten trenches, start something to keep up their morale, pile up casualties and drive the survivors to despair. This was done not to win a battle, not even to gain a few yards of ground, but simply because it was supposed to be the thing to do. All the armies in that idiot war shoveled divisions into attacks, often as boneheaded as ours were, just as if healthy young men had begun to seem hateful in the sight of Europe. But the British command specialised in throwing men away for nothing. The tradition of an officer class, defying both imagination and common sense, killed most of my friends, as surely as if those cavalry generals had come out of the chateau with polo mallets and beaten their brains out. Call this class prejudice if you like, so long as you remember that I went into the war with no such prejudice, free of any class feeling. No doubt, I came out of it with a chip on my shoulder, a very large chip, probably some friend's thigh bone. After the war, Priestley went to Cambridge University. He married a librarian, Pats, in uh, 1921, and they had two children soon afterwards. But despite having a family to feed, he bravely decided to become a full-time writer. He struggled at first, but The Good Companions, published in 1929, made him famous and also made him a wealthy man. For many years, he wrote about the war only in drama and fiction, and then only in its lighter aspects, like the very funny short story, The Town Major of Maricourt. But in uh, 1933, he began the journey that was to be published as English Journey in 1934. And in the course of that journey, he returned to his native Bradford for a reunion of his wartime comrades. And that event crystallised his disgust at the way that many of those who had fought for their country had simply been tossed aside. Several of us had arranged with the secretary to say that the original members of the battalion, to whom the price of the dinner was prohibited, were provided with free tickets. But this, he told me, had not worked very well. And my old platoon comrades confirmed this too when I asked about one or two of the men. They were so poor, these fellows, that they said they could not attend the dinner, even if provided with free tickets, 
because they felt that their clothes were not good enough. They ought to have known that they would have been welcome in the sorriest rags, but their pride would not allow them to come. I did not like to think then how bad their clothes, their whole circumstances were. It is not, indeed, a pleasant subject. They were with us, swinging along while the women and old men cheered in that early battalion of Kitchener's new army, were with us when kings, statesmen, general officers all reviewed us, when the crowd threw flowers, blessed us, cried over us, and then they stood in the mud and water, scrambled through the broken strips of barbed wire. When, when they saw the sky darken and the earth open with red-hot steel, and came back as official heroes, and also as young, old workmen, wanting to pick up their jobs and their ordinary life again. And now, in 1933, they could not even join us in a tavern, because they had not decent coats to their backs. We could drink to the tragedy of the dead, but we could only stare at one another in pitiful embarrassment over this tragic comedy of the living, who had fought for a world that did not want them, who had come back to exchange their uniforms for rags. Priestley's mourning for the lost generation killed in the Great War was compounded by his anger at the poverty and humiliation of so many of those who had fought and survived. It fueled his conviction that never again should there be a betrayal of the wartime promises of homes fit for heroes for those returning at the end of a war. Already a socialist, called a red, he said himself, but actually of pink, and that a friendly, healthy colour, as he called it, he disliked extremes of right and left and was one of the first voices raised against Hitler during the 1930s, a time when, as you know, many Britons were actively in favour. Priestley's criticisms of Hitler earned him a place on the Nazi death list. Had the Germans ever invaded Britain, he would have been one of the first to be rounded up and shot. But he was equally clear-eyed about the evils of Stalinism, though he saw the Soviet Union as an absolutely vital ally against Hitler in the war he felt was inevitable. And he was horrified at the way the anti-red feeling in so much of British policy had pushed Stalin into the arms of Hitler as he saw it. He was also a big admirer of Churchill and had urged his inclusion in the government for many years, though that admiration was probably not reciprocated. A soldier in World War I, Priestley used his words as weapons in World War II. He was recruited by the BBC, largely, I think, as a counter to Lord Hawhall's uh, broadcast from Germany, which were far more popular with the British public than was ever admitted at the time. The first broadcast Priestley made was immediately after the disaster of Dunkirk. Churchill made his famous We Shall Fight Them on the Beaches speech on the 4th of June, 1940. And on the following night, Priestley made a very different but equally stirring broadcast that showcased his unmatched ability to find links between such great events and small, homely things, and gave his broadcast such a universal appeal. Here at Dunkirk is another English epic, and to my mind what was most characteristically English about it, so typical of us, so absurd, and yet so grand and gallant that you hardly knew whether to laugh or to cry when you read about them, was the part played in the difficult and dangerous embarkation not by the warships, magnificent though they were, but by the little pleasure steamers. We've known them and laughed at them, these fussy little steamers, all our lives. We have called them the Shilling Six. We have watched them load and unload their crowds of holiday passengers, their gents full of high spirits and bottled beer, the ladies eating pork pies, the children sticky with peppermint rock. Sometimes they only went as far as the next seaside resort, but the boldest of them might manage a channel crossing to let everybody have a glimpse of Boulogne. They were usually paddle steamers, making a great deal more fuss with all their churning than they made speed. And they weren't proud, for they let you see their works going round. They liked to call themselves queens and bells. And even if they were new, there was always something old-fashioned, a Dickens touch, a mid-Victorian air about them. They seemed to belong to the same ridiculous holiday world as pierrots and peers, sandcastles, ham and egg teas, palmists, automatic machines and crowded, sweaty promenades. But they were called out of that world, and, let it be noted, they were called out in good time and good order. Yes, these Brighton Bells and Brighton Queens 
left that innocent, foolish world of theirs to sail into the inferno, to defy bombs, shells, magnetic mines, torpedoes, machine gun fire, to rescue our soldiers. Some of them, alas, will never return. Among those paddle steamers that will never return was one that I knew well, for it was the pride of our ferry service to the Isle of Wight. None other than the good ship Gracie Fields. I tell you, we were proud of the Gracie Fields, for she was that glittering queen of our local line, and instead of taking an hour over her voyage, used to do it churning like mad in 45 minutes. And now, never again will we board her at Cow's and go down into her dining saloon for a fine breakfast of bacon and eggs. She had paddled and churned away forever. But now look, this little steamer, like all her brave and battered sisters, is immortal. She'll proudly go sailing down the years in the epic of Dunkirk. And our great-grandchildren, when they learn how we began this war by snatching glory out of defeat and then swept on to victory, may also learn how the little holiday steamers made an excursion to hell and came back glorious. The broadcast was a tremendous success, and the following Sunday, Priestley began a series of regular weekly talks called Postscripts, which were broadcast immediately after the nine o'clock news. Priestley came from a middle-class background and was a Cambridge graduate who had been living in the south of England for over 20 years, but he'd never lost his Yorkshire accent, and in an era of received pronunciation and broadcasting of such formalities that announcers even wore dinner jackets, Priestley's unpretentious manner and warm North Country vowels were a breath of fresh air. His military service in the Great War, his status as an outsider, not a member of the establishment or BBC apparatchik, and his natural embassy with the concerns of ordinary Britons, both male and female, gave him an authority that few others could match, and he became a hugely popular broadcaster, a reassuring and familiar voice, articulating the feelings of millions of Britain in dark and troubled times. Priestley's blend of a feel for Britain's landscape and traditions, with an innate and optimistic belief in the basic goodness and decency of ordinary British people and the destiny they shared, might have struck many as romantic, even naive, but it resonated powerfully with his audience. He had listeners of, of audiences of 16 million listening to his broadcast on a Sunday night, and he also became a very, very influential broadcaster to the United States. And I think it's fair to say that Priestley's broadcasts were one of the key factors in shifting sympathies in the United States, away from the quite broad sympathy there was for Germany in the early stage of the war in many parts of the United States, into creating the conditions where Roosevelt could actually take the Americans into the war. While Churchill's broadcast centred on great events on the world stage and the need for Britons to strain every sinew in the war effort, Priestley's tales focused on simple domestic themes, a celebration of Britishness and the British way of life that was equally potent in reminding Britons why they were fighting and what they were fighting for. Even when his subject was as homely as a meat and potato pie in a Bradford pie shop, after he returned to his native city to see the aftermath of a German bombing raid. The sight made a far deeper impression on me than all the bombing I'd seen for weeks and weeks in London, because it somehow brought together two entirely different worlds, the safe and shining world of my childhood and this insecure and lunatic world of today. I was appalled by the sheer stupidity of it, these Nazi airmen had flown hundreds and hundreds of miles in order to destroy a draper's shop, part of a cinema, a market, an old chapel, and so on. Nothing that made the least difference to our war effort. Nothing that couldn't soon be replaced, except, of course, the old walls of the chapel. Even already the drapers had taken other premises, the markets open, and I've no doubt that the congregation of the old chapel had found hospitality if perhaps an inferior brand of sermon, at other places of worship. Moreover, and now we come to the point, the pie shop and the pie were still there. I must explain about these. Ever since I could remember, there'd been, just at the back of the drapers, a small eating house that specialised in meat and potato pie, one of those little Dickensy places that still survive in provincial towns. I remembered it well. Though I was never one of its customers, because there'd always been, on view in the window, 
to tempt the appetite of the passerby, a giant, almost superhuman, meat and potato pie with a magnificently brown, crisp, artfully wrinkled, succulent looking crust. And not only that, and now we approach the marvellous, the miraculous. Out of that pie, there came at any and every hour when the shop was doing business, a fine, rich, appetising steam to make the mouth water, even as the very window itself were watering. There it was, a perpetual volcano of a meat and potato pie, and that steaming giant pie was to my boyish mind, and, indeed, to my adult mind, for we never forget these things, as much an essential part of my native city as the town hall and its chimes. Now, I'd heard that this shop and its famous steaming pie had been destroyed in the raid, so when I went to see what had happened, I'd made up in my mind that I would stand in the ruins of that shop and compose some kind of lament or eulogy. But I found that the shop hadn't finished, but there was, wide open and doing business. True, it was showing a few scars, and instead of the window, uh, it had been neatly boarded up, but there was a square opening in the middle of the painted boarding, and there, seen through the opening, framed perhaps a little narrowly, but in itself as magnificent as ever, was the great pie, still brown, crisp and succulent, and steaming away like mad. Every puff and jet of that steam defied Hitler, Goering, and the whole gang of them. It was glorious. Now, the owner himself, an elderly man with one of those folded-in Yorkshire faces and character written all over him, was standing just inside the doorway. So I asked him, in my delight and relief, what had happened. He replied shortly, and indeed rather grumpily, that the shop had had its front blown out, but was now, as I could see, and the famous pie hadn't been damaged at all, because it was his habit when closing the shop to remove this noble trademark to a place of safety. As he said, I could feel his hand on my back and the distinct sensation of being gently but firmly ushered into the street where the hand hinted I belonged. Rather grieved by his suspicious reception, I went further along to have a closer look at the neighbouring ruins. I had not been there more than a minute or two before I was clapped on the shoulder and there was the pie man again, this time wearing his coat and not his apron, holding out a hand and beaming at me. It seems that his wife recognised my voice, and so, after doing a quick change with his apron and coat, he came after me. He didn't admit as much, but I think that he'd imagined I was some trade rival. No doubt I had a look of the younger, ambitious pie man about me, <laughs> who was anxious to discover, after years of unsuccessful fifth-column work, what the secret of the famous steaming pie was. Now this secret was revealed to me, without my even asking, by its owner, all smiles and friendship and confidence, but, of course, I can't pass it on to all you people, I'd uh, entertained the suspicions ever since I was the age of 14 about how the giant pie got its steam, forever jetting forth its fragrant aroma, and they were now amply confirmed. Aye, said the pie man proudly, it's a secret, that pie is, and a rare lot do like to know how it's done. I've had it five and forty years, that same pie, and luckily I put it away in a good safe place, same as usual. So, as soon as we got started again, and wasn't long I can tell you, he added wistfully, that's all I'd left in centre at boarding to see the pie through. Ah, well, it's not quite big enough. I wanted to tell him that that was a national fault of ours. We have the pie, and nobody's going to take it from us. But we do have a habit of boarding it up a bit too closely. And we need to open it out, and give the people a better look at the pie. And indeed, give the pie a better sight of the people. <laughs> and now, I suppose, all my more severe listeners are asking each other why this fellow has to go on yapping about his pies and nonsense at a time like this when the whole world is in turmoil. The fate of empires is in the balance, and men, women and children are dying terrible, violent deaths. To which I can only reply, that we must keep burnished the bright, little thread of our common humanity, 
that still run through these iron days and black nights, and that we are fighting to preserve, and indeed I hope, to enlarge that private and all-important little world of our own reminiscence and humour and homely poetry, in which a pie that steamed for 45 years and successfully defied an air raid to steam again as its own proper place. Although Priestley's talks were hugely popular with the public, they were viewed with much less favour by what he termed hard-shell right-wing Tories. And senior Tories mounted a vigorous campaign against Priestley, claiming he was a divisive figure, setting, as one said, rich against poor and annoying the country districts. However, Priestley carried on as before and mocked his critics in one broadcasty mode. Among bundles of very friendly letters, just lately I've been getting some fierce and angry ones, telling me to get off the air before the government puts you where you belong. The real fascist Dutch. Well, obviously, it wouldn't matter much if I were taken off the air, but it would matter a great deal, even to those blimps, if these young men of the RAF were taken off the air. And so I repeat my question, in return for their skill, devotion, endurance and self-sacrifice, what are we civilians prepared to do? And surely the answer is that the least we can do is give our minds honestly and sincerely, and without immediate self-interest, to the task of preparing a world really fit for them and their kind, to arrange for them a final happy landing. In response to the criticism, Priestley was stood down from the broadcast for a few weeks, provoking much criticism from the public as a result. But he returned to the microphone even more determined to air his views. But the Tory right wing was infuriated that he'd then again been given a platform and they were outraged by the content of his first broadcast. We've said goodbye to our ordinary lives in order to make a real fight of it. So while we're at it, let's make a real fight of it and not only banish Hitler and his gang from the scene, but also all the conditions that made Hitler possible. It's just as if we were called upon to set aside everything to battle against a plague of typhoid due to bad drains. And those of us who said that while we were at it, might as well attend to the drains, were rebuked for not taking sufficient interest in fighting the plague. If we fight with ideas as well as weapons, we shall not only help to construct a world worth living in, but also shorten this war, perhaps by years. What we want is a short, clear creed, acceptable to the decent common man everywhere, that will act like a trumpet call, and then we must proclaim it every hour of the day and night, sending it thundering through the ether, showering it down in millions of pamphlets, painting it indelibly on walls, until at last even the Nazis themselves see it written in letters of fire everywhere, and their huge, crazy empire of blood and terror suddenly cracks and totters and crashes to its doom. It might fall like Jericho, but not if we merely mutter dreary old political platitudes at it, but as in the book of Joshua, when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. It was, you see, the people who gave the great shout. Priestley's most powerful critic was Winston Churchill himself, Whatever his feelings about Priestley, and as a socialist, Priestley would clearly never have been high on Churchill's Christmas card list, to make one of many speeches urging Britons to focus exclusively on winning the war and abandon thoughts of everything else, and then have Priestley effectively telling them to disregard everything they just heard, drove Churchill into a fury. He fired off a memo to Duff Cooper, a Tory loyalist who had been parachuted in as Director General of the BBC by Churchill at the start of the war to replace Lord Reith. And he found himself, Churchill, expressing regret that, quote, we have got Mr. J.B. Priestley back, and went on to complain that Priestley was advancing an argument strongly contrary to my known views, is far from friendly to the government, and I should not be too sure about him on larger matters either. Duff Cooper now made the final decision to terminate Priestley's broadcasts. The final postscript was broadcast on Sunday the 23rd March, 1941. And though he continued to broadcast very successfully to the United States, Priestley's postscripts were now over. 
and he was blazing with a sense of injustice about the way that they had been terminated. I was taken off the air. This annoyed me. Not because I was anxious to continue these home broadcasts, I was still busy with the overseas talks, but because I dislike being pushed around, especially when I can't discover who is doing the pushing. I received two letters. I kept them for years, but may have lost them now. And one was from the Ministry of Information, telling me that the BBC was responsible for the decision to take me off the air. The other was from the BBC, saying that a directive had come from the Ministry of Information to take me off the air. While blaming each other, I think both of them were concealing this essential fact that the order to shut me up had come from elsewhere. I don't know how other people feel about this stealthy hocus-pocus, but to my mind, it is one of the most contemptible features of British public life. Power is exercised in such a way, a nod here, a wink there, that it can't be challenged. We are democratic and free in theory, but not in practice. Work may be censored, as it is elsewhere, but not openly, through a censor's office everybody knows about. It is quietly shuffled and conjured away. Men are squeezed out of public jobs, not for political reasons, oh dear, no, but because they are discovered to be not quite the right type, not sound, old boy. This is the British way, slimy with self-deception and cant, and the older I get, the more I dislike it. In the researches uh, both I and Ted Priestley did, we never did discover a smoking gun. As far as we know, there is no memo from Winston Churchill saying, sack Priestley. But the way the British establishment worked then, and perhaps still works today to an extent, there really wouldn't have to be. All it would take was a word coming down, slipped into the ear of somebody in one of those uh, panelled and leather armchaired clubs in St James, suggesting that on the whole it would be better if uh, Priestley disappeared. Indeed, the mere knowledge that Churchill and other leading Tories were infuriated by Priestley's broadcasts and accusing the BBC of left-wing bias, something they've been routinely accused of from the inception of the BBC to the present day, might well have been enough. The 1945 Labour landslide was a a real game-changer in political terms and suggested that perhaps Priestley, rather than Churchill, was more in tune with the mood of the British public during the war. However, Priestley's euphoria was rapidly replaced with despair as the Cold War broke out. He was certainly no fan of Stalin, that's true, but unlike almost everybody else in Britain, he'd actually visited the Soviet Union twice in 1945 and 1946 in the aftermath of the war and seen for himself the absolutely devastated state of the Soviet Union. As you know, I'm sure they've borne the brunt of the uh, German army. 190 divisions were serving on the Eastern Front. 30 million people had died. Property damage was put at over 700 billion rubles. 1,700 towns and cities and 70,000 villages had been completely or partially destroyed. 30,000 factories had gone, and on and on the statistics go. Priestley was convinced that there was absolutely no appetite whatsoever in the Soviet Union for war, while the aggressors, Germany and Japan, had their industry rebuilt with generous American financial aid, there was no Marshall Plan for the Soviet Union. They had to rebuild their own industry themselves. The Russians are irritating, he once said, and I ought to know, having had plenty of dealings with them, that they want war about as much as I want to go ten rounds with Joe Louis, the uh, heavyweight boxer. But the bellicose Churchill and the nuclear-armed Truman fueled Soviet paranoia about Western intentions, and to Priestley's despair, an escalating arms race between East and West rapidly developed. Priestley felt that all Britain's social gains from the Labour landslide in 1945, including the National Health Service, were being threatened by massive military spending and the menace of nuclear arms. He could have retired to his pipe and slippers, he was approaching 70 by this time, but he launched one final campaign against nuclear weapons and wrote an article in the New Statesman in 1954 lambasting the follies, falsehoods and absolute surrealism of the nuclear arms race. In 1957, a previous opponent of the nuclear weapons, Nye Bevan, made a speech at the Labour Party conference supporting the bomb. That, as Priestley said, seemed to many of us to slam the door in our faces. In response, he wrote another article in the New Statesman that, first of all, listed every argument he could find in favour of nuclear weapons and then demolishing them all one by one. 
Though it is true, as Mr Bevan argued, that independent action by this country to ban nuclear bombs would involve our foreign minister in many difficulties, most of us would rather have a bewildered and overworked foreign office than a country about to be turned into a radioactive cemetery. Getting out of the water may be difficult, but it is better than drowning. The successful launching of the Soviet satellite, followed by an immediate outbreak of what may fairly be called satellitis, produced a rise in temperature and signs of delirium. In the poker game, where Britain still sits, nervously fingering a few remaining chips, like a treasury official playing with two drunk oil millionaires, the stakes have been doubled again. Disarmament talks must now take place in an atmosphere properly belonging to boys' papers and science fiction, though already charged with far more hysterical competitiveness. If statesmanship is to see us through, it will have to break the familiar and dubious pattern of the last few years. Perhaps what we need now before it is too late is not statesmanship, but lifesmanship. One ultimate weapon, the final deterrent, succeeds another. After the bombs, the intercontinental rockets. After the rockets, the guided missile submarine, which will carry a guided missile with a nuclear warhead and appear off the coasts of any country in the world with the capability of penetrating the centre of any continent. <coughs> the prospect now is not of countries without navies, but of navies without countries. And we have arrived at an insane regress of ultimate weapons that are not ultimate. There was a massive response to the, that article. It was the catalyst for like-minded people to come together. It led directly to the formation of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, CND. Milton Russell was its first president, and Priestley, a vice president. He uh, refused to go on the first march to the Atomic Weapons Establishment at Aldermaston, however, saying that he'd done quite enough marching during the First World War and wasn't going to do any more now. This Priestley's Wars was the first book of new material from Priestley for over 30 years, and there will never be another one because there simply isn't any more unpublished material to write. As Nigel was saying at the start, I think Priestley's reputation, though still strong, obviously, in, in Yorkshire, has taken a severe dent elsewhere, and I suspect there are probably two reasons for that. One is that Priestley was simply so prolific. He wrote in every form and every medium, plays, novels, non-fiction, magazine articles, newspaper articles, polemics, and so on. And I think he was devalued, if you like, by literary types as a result. We thought a man that was that prolific and that versatile probably couldn't be a serious writer at all. And the other reason, I think, is simply that he was so successful in his own lifetime. We, re we writers yield to no one in our... Uh, mean-mouthed uh, reluctance to admire the work of anybody who's uh, more successful, more popular, and, and worst of all, more wealthy than we are. And Priestley was a hugely successful and wealthy author in his own life. And I think that's led people to devalue it. He writes the most beautiful, effortless prose, and yet you know that that prose must have taken a huge effort to produce, but it reads absolutely beautiful. He was a, an absolute literary giant, and I think in him, the ordinary people of Britain never had a more true and dedicated champion, one who, unlike many of his peers and successors, never patronised, never talked down to people who were born in less gilded circumstances or lived out their lives in less rarefied atmospheres. Let's leave the last word to Priestley himself, because despite his uh, disappointment, I think, with the post-war world and his dislike of the crass materialism, he never lost... I think, the optimism about the future that he once possessed. Though growing old, gouty and grumpy, weary of power mania and propaganda and all their imbecilities, I have not yet abandoned the hope I felt and tried to celebrate in wartime. Thank you very much.